If it is simply a matter of listening to the rhetoric, an Israeli invasion of southern Lebanon looks like a question of when, not if. The head of the Israeli army told his troops up on the border between the two countries that the ongoing airstrikes against Hezbollah targets were to prepare the ground for military boots, their boots, to enter enemy territory. Prepare yourselves, he told them. We are in the process of planning a manoeuvre. But is it no more than bluster and threat? The Pentagon said this evening it doesn't look like something is imminent, but then added the Israelis can speak for themselves. Today, they let their constant barrage of southern Lebanon do the talking. Airstrikes killed another 50 people once again. They included children and women. The welcome sign at the entrance to Misra tells of peace and safety. Any sense of peace and safety was shattered mid-morning. An Israeli rocket hitting homes and buildings in a sheer part of a predominantly Christian neighbourhood. It's hours now since the attack, but under the rubble there are still at least 15 people, many women and children still trapped. The rescue services have been able to get some out alive, but the majority have been dead. Why this particular house was targeted is still unclear. But the strike was part of Israel's declared mission to target Hezbollah fighters. The house was also a family home. The Israeli calling card, the rubble left behind. We really, really uh, ask from all the international community to stop, to stop this war because women and kids are for nothing on all this. This is a pro Hezbollah area. When I spoke with one of the group's MPs, he likened the situation to Gaza. What happened in Gaza is happening in Lebanon, he told me, and vowed Hezbollah would continue their fight. For a third day, the attacks continued across Lebanon, in the north, to the east. And in the south. The death toll so far has reached 50, but that figure will rise. The details of some of those killed in the past days are now becoming known. Among them, Dina Darwish, who worked in the UN's Bekar office. She died along with her young son, Jad. They were killed in an airstrike on their home. Five year old Celine and three year old Eileen died alongside their mother, grandmother, and uncle in an Israeli strike on their home in the south. Mohammed died on his eighth birthday, alongside his mum, dad, sister and brother. And one-year-old Fatima, who was found dead in her mother's arms after the family moved to Beirut for safety. They were buried side by side. Lebanon's hospitals are now packed with the wounded. Sumaya Musawi was outside her home in Baalbek when the jets arrived. At first, we heard the plane striking far away, but then suddenly they hit right next to us. We were all thrown in different directions. My two cousins and my father were killed, and another cousin is still in critical condition in the hospital. We were just sitting outside, not expecting them to strike next to us because there were no Hezbollah positions where we were. Many share that experience. Many more may do so in the days ahead. Emma Murphy, News at 10, Beirut. Well, tonight, John is in Tel Aviv, Emma is in Beirut, and James is at the RAF base in Akrotiri in Cyprus, where they are preparing a plan to rescue British citizens. James, maybe let's begin with you. What would happen in the event of evacuations? Well, they've been planning this really ever since all this kicked off in, in the Middle East a year ago. Uh, 700 troops are, are either here uh, or on their way, led by the Royal Marines. Uh, we know the United States, too, are sending troops to, to uh, get their people out, and other countries may well join in. Cyprus very happy to act uh, as a bridgehead uh, for this evacuation, as they did, if you remember, from that evacuation from Sudan last year. Now, the, inter the there are still flights leaving from the internet National Airport, but as you heard in Geraint's report, people are finding it very hard to get on them. As long as that airport is open, if this operation starts, the idea is to get people out from the airport on either civilian chartered aircraft or military transports. If, however, the airport 
ends up being closed, there's a backup plan, which is to take the two uh, Royal Navy ships uh, in this area uh, up to Tripoli in northern Lebanon and get people out from there. Um, so there is a plan and a backup. What they don't really know is how many are going to want to come. Uh, as Geraint said, many thousands are there, but we really don't know how many uh, want to leave, how many are able to get to a point from which they can leave, uh, and how many have uh, relatives or dependents who they can't leave behind or who haven't got passports themselves. OK, James, thank you very much. Well, John, we've seen two apparent escalations today. The head of the army talking about a possible invasion, not the first time we've heard that, uh, and that ballistic missile over Tel Aviv uh, that you mentioned. Where, I mean, we keep hearing talk of invasion. It hasn't happened. Where do you think that leaves us tonight? Well, looking at the ballistic missile first, Tom, I think that was a clear message from Hezbollah that while they may be battered and bruised, they still possess the most formidable arsenal of strategic missiles of any non-state actor in the world. Now, regarding the Israeli threat to go into Lebanon, as you know, over the last week, one of the top brass or a government minister has mentioned this possibility on a daily basis. And that's part and parcel of keeping the pressure on Hezbollah to call a ceasefire. But tonight, the Biden administration, in the form of the Pentagon, somewhat undermined Israel's threatening posture by saying that an invasion is not imminent. We know the Americans do not want the Israelis to escalate this conflict. And indeed, tonight here, Tom, there are tentative reports of a peace plan that envisages an initial four-week ceasefire during which the United, uh, the United Nations Security Council would try to persuade Hezbollah to pull back from the border, as they're actually obliged to do under the resolution that ended the 2006 war. Does this plan have any chance, Tom? It's, it's too early to say, but fingers crossed, obviously. OK, John, thank you very much indeed. Well, Emma, finally to you, the airstrikes are a reality, as you are all too aware and you're uh, well aware and your very vivid reporting is showing us night after night. The threats of invasion, you know, as John was saying, may or may not be real. Will the Israelis ultimately succeed in their aims, do you think? Well, history would suggest that there isn't a great chance of success between these two. Um, I don't think you need to look too far back, though, because actually take a look at the present situation and the events of the last year. Prime Minister Netanyahu says that he wants to exert maximum pressure. He wants to break Hezbollah. He wants to get his people back to the north. He wants to increase the security for Israel. That's all very well, but it has a real echo of what's been said over the past year when it comes to Gaza and Hamas. We've heard from him that he wants to see Hamas weakened, he wants Israel to have greater security, and he wants those hostages home. But they have exerted maximum force in Gaza, they continue to do so, and it hasn't had the result that he requires and that he demands. Whether or not this ground offensive should it happen and these continual airstrikes that are definitely happening can do that, well, it seems incredibly unlikely. And as for that peace plan that's being proposed that Johnny was just talking about then, they've been trying to get a peace plan in Gaza for over a year and they still haven't got it. So I don't think that bodes particularly well for the situation here now.